Welcome to the sixth episode of season three of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's quite late on Monday the 26th of April 2010 and in this episode we are going to review two tiny computers. We'll talk about the gap between Ubuntu and Debian developers. We will of course cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu and go over your feedback. I'm Tony and there's three people with me here this evening. I'm looking around the room and I'm going to say hello to Simon. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm tired. Yeah? We've been waffling for hours. Yeah. I've been here since half seven. That, 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 we call that the pre-show. Oh, okay, We've been right, caring right. and sharing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Feeling the love. It's been fun. Well, it has yeah. been. Yeah. So what have you been up to in the recent days? Or uh, A couple of things. I've been doing a bit more bug work, uh, oh, yeah. which has been uh, fun and not fun (laughs) say it again like you mean it well it has been fun but it's not been fun which is why we're doing the seg today because i've been getting incredibly frustrated right um although i've I've actually had an answer today which actually makes the seg go away but i think it's important to discuss it (laughs) uh so my frustration has been resolved uh so what you're saying is you're wrong but we're still going to talk no i'm not wrong i've just learned just going to list the ways and the other thing i've done is um i've set up a mirror at home oh cool which i've not done before uh, and that's probably a segment itself, but uh, I a lucid mirror, de- a lucid mirror, yeah. which downloaded sixty gig, uh, which is big. Is that really because, worthwhile? Well, see, how many machines do you well, have that run lucid? I mean. I've got, I will have five at home. So it's, and you've got to bear in mind that when I'm doing the bug work, I'm actually using VMs. So oh, install, doing reinstalls, doing reinstalls. So yeah. it doesn't package. make sense. But with Meerkat. Um, rapidly coming. I'll have to do another 60 gig download yeah. uh, fairly shortly. But uh, it's been fun learning. I, I run a mirror purely because the bandwidth here is not all that great. So that when I do want to install a big package, I've not got to wait for hours to, for it to download. Yeah, it's a lot of, my reason. Uh, a lot of Much think, more think yourselves lucky. I usually install packages at work when I'm on GPRS. Uh, it's like <laughs> dial up. It's horrid. If I did it what? at work, I wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> I've got a 100 megabit fibre. But there you go. <sighs> Um, and so Alan's here as well. Hello. Boasting about his GPRS speed. <laughs> um, yes. How are you? I'm, I'm not too bad. Not too bad. Um, what have you been uh, doing? Have you been playing with anything interesting? Um, I, I've been playing with my juggler still. Cool. And other okay. people's jug- breaking other people's jugglers <laughs> yes. as well. Um, and I've got, you know, I keep going on about this Drobo thing. Yeah. I've got a new one. Ooh. Not, I didn't better? buy a new one. I've got a replacement. <laughs> You've got two. Ah. The warranty was running out. And um, it was really noisy. It used to be on my desk and it was too noisy. And I was trying to record screencasts and do like Skype calls and stuff. And it was just right next to my ear. So I moved it under the desk and it was still under the desk. So I've now moved it three doors away into the utility room on top of the fridge in the middle of the house. And I can still hear it. And when I go to bed, I'm standing above it and I can hear the house going. So it's not just your laptop. No, no, this was the this was the Drobo. Oh, actually, also, I cleaned out the laptop, and that doesn't make any noise either. Wow. So I got a new Drobo, and it's quieter and faster. And just as a piece of background information, you've got two kids, so it's making more noise than they are put together. Yeah, well, when they're asleep, yeah. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> not during the day, no. That's quite spectacular. Yeah. Cool. And last but not least, Laura. Hi. Hello. How are you? Um, I'm all right, thank you. Good. I've been spent the day doing usability testing. Oh, right, at work. At work, um, but specifically group usability testing, which is quite interesting because I had four people to observe at once, which is Ooh. okay until they decide to split into two groups. Uh, and then you've got to follow two conversations <laughs> at once and take lots of meaningful notes. The people's front of user testing and the user testing people's front, is that right? Yeah, okay. well, it, it made sense and stuff, but uh, no, it's quite good because people tend to work on things in groups or by interacting over irc or whatever so it actually makes a lot of sense mm, wicked so. well i'm glad you had a, a productive day i've not been doing very much i handed in my last essay for a few weeks Yay. last week and then i've been kind of ramping up on odd camp which we'll talk more about a bit later but there's no dave this week so we'll just dive right into the content sounds like a fun pack show <laughs> We had a little mini review from Matt Daubney and he sent it to us, so let's play a bit of it now. The Acer Aspar Revo R3600 is a small form factor net top, which is a small low powered computer. This one is powered by an Intel Atom 230, which is a 1.6 gigahertz single core processor. It comes with a gigabyte of RAM, a single 160 gigabyte laptop style hard drive, uh, 802.11n wireless networking, loads of USB inputs, an eSATA port, a single VGA output, 
a single gigabyte, gigabit LAN socket and an HDMI output. The HDMI output is powered through the onboard NVIDIA ION integrated graphics card. When you first power it on, the unit should come up with a Linux variant. However, the first time I booted mine, it just booted to a screen full of 99s and then stopped and asked for boot media. Uh, this didn't trouble me too much as I simply created a uh, USB boot disk using a standard Ubuntu live CD, uh, stuck it straight in the box and it booted from that. The nice thing of using the live CD was it proved that everything in the box just worked. Using the box as a home office machine seems quite reasonable. Open Office will run quite happily along with Firefox and Evolution at the same time. If you pushed it much more than this I suspect you'd start to get judderiness and slowdown as the little atom tries to keep up with you. The one thing that the live CD didn't run on boot was the NVIDIA binary driver. This is required in order to use the HDMI output. The integrated ION graphics card allows you to play back HD video even at 1080p. This is despite the fact that the unit only comes with a single core 1.6 GHz processor. Now, a few of us have got these little hardware devices and we want to talk about a couple of them. Yes. I think, has everybody got a Revo? Nope. No, no, not Simon. No. No. I, Dave has one. I've got one. You've got, I've got I've two, got, actually. Yeah, so you've got more than actually, one. Actually, no, I've you? got three. That's quite sad. <laughs> I've only got the one. Actually, technically, one of them my mum has. Right. They are very nice, I have to say. Mm. Um, I use mine as a media uh, a media box, so it runs Myth TV, front end and back end. It's HDMI output straight into the uh, HD telly. Yeah. Lovely stuff. So what is it? It's a small PC, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, Matt's sort of described a bit of some of the internal specs on it, but mm. it's it's beefy enough for, for the job, and it's physically small. I mean, it looks it's next to the Wii. Um, underneath the telly and it looks very similar to that in terms of its overall bulk so it's quite discreet tucks in there compared with the big boxy pc that it replaced which i'm sure you'll remember used to sort of sit on the top there a big great silver thing um it's sweet it's and sweet. actually you can attach it to the back of the screen yes it comes I've, with a little kind of plate doesn't it yeah i've got one in the bedroom and it's attached to the back of the telly in the bedroom i haven't done that i don't know why no i don't know why either don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why you haven't attached because it's a faff to get to yeah, I guess yeah. there is that. You don't, once you've, don't once you've plugged to. it in, you don't need to get to it. It's kind of just like clunk. And you can easily unclip it and clip it back on. Oh, right. It doesn't, it's not permanent. You just and pull it off. Yeah, I might have to have a look at that. I point. need to sort that out. I wouldn't like that noise. <laughs> you don't like that noise? <laughs> no. Right. Don't, don't pull it off then. Okay. <laughs> Simple. But I got the um, uh, audio going over HDMI straight into the TV. So that yeah. that worked as, worked as well. And yeah. literally, I mean, when I first started playing with MythTV, it took me days to get a basic functioning system but with a revo and myth buntu thanks to dave and his cronies it just was done in a inside a day and that some of that was fiddling around that i wouldn't normally have had to do because i was tweaking stuff yeah when i first got mine it was um running karmic and um i had a few issues with it but i ran boxy and i oh, used yeah. that to watch video that i'd got on my network shared drive thing and use the remote control and it just worked and up down left right fire watch the program and it watches then it it's nvidia so you need the binary driver the, the it's got the special accelerated technology that is vdpau that's the badger excellent yes. well, so it basically it. offloads the video playback to the gpu so it, um, yeah it's really nice i know a lot of people have got these kind of ion nvidia ion based things and they all seem to work okay if you don't mind having the evil nvidia driver when you say they work okay, they seem to be great as media players. Are they, are they good as PCs? Well, it's funny you should say that. Um, my mum has one as her PC. Oh, right. And, um, well, her use is started... So far, she's used it for surfing the web a little bit, getting your Wikipedia, that kind of stuff, um, playing back um, music and stuff like that, and nothing really too heavyweight. So as a light, you know, average user... I know we keep saying there's no such thing as an average user, <laughs> but I think there is. And I think they're okay for average users. And you're speaking, so... Sorry, yes, exactly. <laughs> so I'm right. I mean, it's a similar sort of spec to a netbook, really, isn't it? It's a netbook in a yeah, different form. Yeah, it is exactly the same as a netbook, yeah. yeah. So anything you could do with a netbook... Although most netbooks don't... Well, they are starting to, but most netbooks don't have these NVIDIA video cards. No, true, true. So it's actually a bit more pokey than a 
Yeah. And it's also got eSATA. So if you wanted to plug an external SATA uh, hard drive into it, then you've got that. And it's got an SD card slot. Loads of USB ports. Five USB ports, I think. Six USB ports, in fact. One, yes. of, them's, one of them's blocked up. I don't know why. Yeah, I noticed That's that. That's weird. I haven't poked around to see if I can work Maybe out. it's disconnected on the inside. Yeah. No, it works, actually. If you just oh, get a screwdriver and pop the little rubber bung in, it works. <laughs> For some reason, I had to do that. Oh. I can't remember why. I had to have six things plugged into it. I don't know what it was. USB hub. Yeah. yeah. That would be good. Is is the USB remote, is it USB the remote that you've plugged in, Tony? Yes, I bought a, a USB remote. Um my old media box had one PCI card and one USB tuner for the for the free view, but obviously this thing can't take PCI cards, so I had to get. I was just using the USB one, and the remote control for the USB one is doesn't have half the buttons you need for Myth TV. So mm. Alan recommended a generic kind of uh, media, media center, center yeah. remote off of eBay. Um, turned up and with a little bit of jiggery pokery to get the key mappings right, it was uh, it was job done. So one of the flaws I think Dave's mentioned about that remote. Or the whole USB remote thing is you can't wake the thing up. So if you if you shut it down or suspend it, you can't wake it. I can go one better than that from USB. What? Press the power button, and the whole thing kernel panics. Oh, nice! <laughs> the kernel panic button. Really? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's lit up as well. It's so red. Two features. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, but other than that, it works very well. Yeah. A minor feature. Did we, you fold the book? I haven't, no. Oh, no. Is that because you hate Launchpad? I don't hate Launchpad. <laughs> I, really? I, I had a couple of tweets from Graham, Graham Bins, uh, telling me how I should, should report bugs. And it's great if you know a Launchpad developer. Um, <laughs> yeah, But that's, that's, I still think my point generally stands. Cool. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so, sorry. Generally, out of if you're going to, out of five, rate the Revo for what you use it for? For what I use it for, a four. Well, why would it need another star? Um, I've had... Uh, a, it crashed once um, and it's a little bit worrying when it's your media thing and TV is very important to me obviously um, and no four's, uh, yeah, four and a half let's go four and a half yeah You're right yeah it's, pre- it's pretty good it's pretty good I like it a lot and they're pretty cheap as well and that's the, that's 150 the quid absolutely can't and you can get it with Windows which is more expensive can't you and they do a dual core version as well with the oh, Atom right. 330 oh. CPU but yes if so, you wanted a more pokey yeah, yeah, desktop yeah. PC um, although arguable whether two cores makes it more pokey or more clock I don't know but yeah so I, I think it's good what about you yeah probably about the same for, yeah. for, uh, uh, um, for what it is yeah it's it's a nice little PC yeah go on then so somebody else has been playing with an Alusha yeah I've had an Alusha T1 T1 that's right, right yeah and uh, you've had a play with it what yeah. do you think is that the what's one the, is the that specs? the one that you brought the other week no yeah black Show yeah, on yeah. the specs. Yeah, go on. It's um, it came with it's. This is slightly different than the spec you get right. on the on the site. Came with uh, two gig of RAM, uh, an Atom to N two seventy CPU, which is the same one point six gigahertz that you get in everything. Uh, Intel video card. It's got a VGA and a DVI output on the back, but no HDMI. Um, and it ours came with a forty gig hard drive. Do you know what it retails at? No. Okay, I'll find that out while you talk. The interesting thing about this one that's slightly different is that it's got uh, wireless built in. As does oh. the Revo. Oh, does it? Yes. It's not so obvious on the Revo no. because the Alusha has an aerial sticking out. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's quite, a, as far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing because you've got a, uh, a socket on the back. So you could, in fact, if you wanted to use it as a, um, a server, you could put a decent aerial on it. Ah, what is a kind of like access, turn it into an access point yeah. and a server all in one. So you could make a mirror. I'm thinking about OCAM this weekend. I was thinking about taking a mirror and that would be perfect because you could have, you could, in theory, turn it into a wireless access point with a mirror on board. Mm. Sounds like a very good idea. I did yeah. make a slight flaw when I got it out of the box and um, screwed the aerial into the thing and then realised that the aerial fouls all the ports on the back <laughs> and they realised that's because I had it upside down. <laughs> And the aerial's supposed to be at the top, not the bottom, fouling all the ports. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to give the T1 a proper kind of road test. I've only looked at it out of the box, and it, but it's industrial in its manufacturing, it is. isn't it? It's, it's not cute like the Revo. It mm. looks like it's about to go in the rack. Yeah. It'll be mounted above a ceiling tile or something like that. <laughs> There's a little bit of inconsistency on the colours as well. So you know how they colour ports? Right. And some of the ports are coloured and some of them aren't. Right. So you know how you have, like, purple for... Um, yeah, keyboard. Well, keyboard and green for something yeah. else. And, <laughs> and and it just it just annoyed me slightly that not all of the ports were coloured. 
the ones on the front are. I don't think the ones on the back aren't. Mm. Well, it's because you can't see them. That would, yeah. And okay. it's designed to go on the back of your TV monitor. Same so thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it doesn't matter that it looks a bit sort of black boxy. Yeah, but, I mean, I don't mind it being black boxy. I think it's just kind of a different feel. I much, feel much more safe in it being somewhere a bit more exposed, perhaps, because of its construction. Mm-hmm. It looks a bit more solid than the Aspire, doesn't it? The yeah. Um, Revo. I don't, I don't, well, yeah, okay, the Revo feels a bit plasticky. Mm. But I think the Revo still feels pretty solid. But yeah. the, the the Alusha came with, um, unlike the Revo, the Revo came with no operating system. It had the splash top Linux on the ROM, uh. no no operating system at all, which was nice. But even nicer, the Alusha came with Ubuntu pre-installed. Oh. Um, mm. Karmic uh, it came with. And it was just four clicks of the mouse, you know, enter your name, what region are you, time zone, job done. Well, I just had a quick look on their website. I can't remember how much RAM you said that, that particular it one. Came with got. two gig. Came with two gig. Okay. Um, the basic price then at the moment they're showing it, it lists with uh, two a ten point four in pre-installed, which is quite clever because it's not out yet. <laughs> well, maybe they'll send them out the second it releases. Um, basically, the price would be just over two hundred pounds for the two gig version with a forty gig hard drive. The spec you just is said. that with the Wi Fi adapter? That's with the Wi Fi. That's, 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 that's the other weird adaptation. thing. I was about to say the great thing about the uh, the T one is uh, you can upgrade it yourself. I don't know if you can whip the back off the Revo and, and yank bits, but you certainly Not can really. on the T one. It's definitely built as sort of a yeah. I opened it up to have a look at how the Wi Fi was connected, and it's a mini PCI Express yeah. or whatever they call it. Yeah. And one of the other options you can get with the T1 is you can get a 1080p playback module Ooh. as an option. But there's two problems with that. One, if you go for that, you lose the wireless because it's the same port. Right. So you okay. either have wireless or you have the 1080p playback module. Yep. And the other problem is it doesn't have HDMI out. Yeah, that's a bit of a shame. But it's got DVI, so you could do DVI to HDMI conversion. And then you'd need to have the audio, audio coming out the sound well. card. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's doable, it's doable. Yeah. yeah, it's doable, um, and it's quite a nice little machine. It has a two and a half inch um, drive on the inside, which of course is easily updatable as well. Upgradable, and it's quiet as well. It's fanless, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's completely completely silent. So Whereas you- the Revo has a fan on the GPU and doesn't kick in usually until it's really you know going for it. Mm. I suppose the metal case of the T1 helps it cool because it's essentially a big heat sink. Yeah. The actual the um, the hard drive is actually screwed to the lid. Oh, right. So when you when you unscrew it and take it apart, not that I've unscrewed and taken it apart, <laughs> but when you, when you take the part, yeah, yeah I did too. <laughs> um, when you lift the lid off, the, the hard drive is screwed to the lid and everything else is on the base. It's quite nice. So is it a similar sort of netbook type motherboard with bits on? It sounds like it's a bit different yeah, from a netbook. It's a little bit different, but it's... Is it a mini it. ITX? Having never ever seen one, it's... I don't know. No, because all the ports are laid out a bit different. I don't think it's a standard okay. mini ITX type oh. motherboard, but it's you know it's got plenty of ports and it seemed to perform pretty well. Yeah, excellent, it's quick so, enough. So, of the two, if you were looking for one for say for your mum, hmm. Well, you see, the, the way the Alusha has it is that you don't have evil Nvidia binary drivers. Ah, oh. it's all Intel, right? So it's all. It's, it's all, all with the 3D, but it's all f- well, not with the when you say 3D, it's Intel video card. Yeah. So Does that have 3D acceleration? It, it comes with... Uh, Compiz is enabled by Compiz, default, yes. Right, okay. So, yeah, you get 3D desktop effects and that kind of stuff. Excellent. But, um, so if you were going to do video playback, then maybe the Alusia with the, the playback module might be good. Mm-hmm. But the fact that the Revo has HDMI out meant that it's just one cable, plug it in there, plug it in the telly, job done. If I was mm. going to go for a media server, I'd go for the Revo. Revo. But if I was going to... Buy something sort of possibly home servery or um, maybe firewall. desktop. Or, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Networky go, type yeah, stuff. I'd go for the T one. Yeah. Actually, that's quite interesting. There's one. That's one thing I haven't tried. Is it'd be interesting to know if the Alusha gets the same sort of shearing that I get with my Revo on on full screen video playback. Playback. Oh, Watching free view, I get. Yeah, only on like when you very fast pans, you start to notice a little bit of shearing on yeah, the picture. I get that as well. Even over HDMI, it'd be interesting to know if the Alusha has the same problem or whether that solves it mm. you should give us some feedback on the next show well it also uh the guys are going to be at og camp yes this is true so we can ask them questions like this and in fact they will be giving away a t1 and a d1 the d1 is a 
slightly different form factor, which I'm very hurriedly just trying to see if I can find. It's a mini Atom PC. Um, so I think it's even... Uh, oh, that's the teeny tiny one, isn't it? Yeah, it's even diddlier. Diddlier? Is that a word? Yeah, yeah, Than the, uh, the, the T1, although it's um, it's got an optical drive and things in it, so it's a, a bit more of a desktop-y cool. um, form factor. But yeah, so two nice little bits of kit, actually. Mm. Mm. The United States Library of Congress has acquired the entire archive of public tweets from Twitter. Google have also introduced real-time searches of Twitter timelines. Is that good? The Republic of Congress, Library of Congress thing. I'm not sure. I I always find, I think Twitter and and Dentica and all that microblogging is very ephemeral and you see it and then it goes away. I don't think, I can't remember how many times I've wanted to go back and reread stuff. No, you won't, but there's lots of good profiling stuff in that. That's true. Yeah, that's true. And the Google, the Google thing for that, but the archive thing was so they could do studies on social interests and things mm, okay. in future. And it's all profiling. And when they uh, tag that to your Facebook account, uh, re- I mean, really. And then they go to Google and they check you out there and they know you and they've never even met you. The Library of Congress is one of those libraries that has uh, one copy of everything that was published, I think, in America. Mm. So this is presumably some sort of extension of, the, of that. And you think, well, actually, who wants a load of old dross about people going, but I did this, or look at this website. But then presumably they've got a lot of old dross in the publishing archive <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah. So in 100 years' time, they'll, you know, students will be studying this Twitter thing that well, we all used to do and even looking in, at our conversations. Even well, in did. four years' time, they'll look back at all the, di- all the general election stuff and see what the excitement was on Twitter yeah. and the digital economy bill. And, yeah. cool. and how it shaped the world. Yeah, or not. <laughs> Sharp have announced another mobile internet device running Ubuntu 9.04. The Netwalker PC T1 has a 5 inch screen supporting 1024 by 600 and a Freescale CPU. Mm. It looks quite shiny. It does, doesn't it? Yes. It's not a million miles away from some of the Nokia uh, sort of N900 in feel, although it's got a stylus and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I, I quite like one. I had a play with their previous one. The um, What was the previous one? The PC Z one. I think, and um, had to play with that at UDS, one of yeah. the guys there. M- really high resolution, and a tiny, tiny, tiny screen. Yeah, and that had a keyboard, though, I think. Yeah, and, and it fitted in your pocket. And this new one hasn't. It's mm. got the right-on-screen type keyboard. I quite like the one with the keyboard. I mean, it was really, really ridiculously tiny. But the guy who had it as an Ubuntu developer, yeah. and he just slipped it into his um, shirt pocket, his suit pocket, and, like, pulled out this PC. It's a full-on PC running Ubuntu. Not like one of these cut down shonky operating systems like Android <laughs> <laughs> but what can you do with it I was going to say what's it yeah. for um, well you Ooh. can do whatever you would do with a computer can't you except yeah. it's really small so does it is it meant to be like a PDA or it's no, a no. mobile internet device yeah you do what you like with it. browse it's the web get your email it's what? like it's like the iPad usual stuff better than like HTC does it no it? it's not <laughs> it's nothing like the iPad iPad's bigger, isn't it? But ugly for a start. <laughs> Did you see um, Blendtec with the iPad? Blending it? Yeah. Will it blend? Oh, it, it did. did. <laughs> <laughs> right, antivirus vendor McAfee, <laughs> love this one, made several people's weeks run much harder recently uh, when their software <laughs> falsely identified a core Windows process as a virus, causing entire networks <gasps> to shut down. Whoops. Yeah, and oh. I felt sorry for them in a way, but then also that internally had that little key chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> you just know there's a whole heap of technicians who are wandering around with CDs and USB, USB sticks keys. trying to get thousands of computers back online. And it was obviously pushed out in the corporate world a lot quicker where they have these centralised update servers that yeah. you know check. And we're the same at work. You know, We've got a, a core update server for our AV. It go, checks every hour. But if we were on every desktop... We'd have to have some kind of protection, and it's entirely plausible this kind yeah. of thing could happen on Linux as well. Could so your smugness would be misplaced. Mm. But it doesn't stop you being smug now. I'm not really smug. I'm just kind of, I don't know. It's it's difficult, really, because I know you know friends who've had to deal with this kind of rubbish. But I don't know there's something nice about like I've told you before about when I was in America and I sat on my Linux PC and the two guys near me were infected with the viruses on their PCs, and they were completely unable to do any work because their machines were rebooting all the time so they went off and played golf now <laughs> arguably that's nice for them and not nice for me although I don't play golf but the, the fact is I was able to carry on working and they weren't you know 
So there, are, there is a say, level of smugness that I... There's a perspective there. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. So. Yeah, I think it was a good thing. Fair enough. We've got some upcoming events, and very soon we have some release parties. Ooh. All around the world, um, but specifically in the UK. There's going to be one in London, one in Banbury, near uh-huh. Oxford, I think that is. Yep. Um, there's a first one in Scotland, I believe. Excellent. And... Um, there isn't going to be one in Manchester, I don't think. There was last year. Right. And I think most of the people from Manchester are coming over to Og Camp uh-huh. in uh, Liverpool because it's nearby-ish. Um, and you can get a list of all of the release parties around the world if you go to wiki.ubuntu.com slash lucid release parties. Or that handy URL that I set up last year, which is houseparty.cx. Does that still direct to the right place? Yes, I Excellent. edited it so it does. <laughs> Brilliant, okay. Sounds like worth going along to. So are you going to any other than Ogcamp? Yeah, I'm going to the London one. May go to the London one. Yeah. <laughs> it's good fun, the London do one. The, the, downside, the downside of the London one is it's in, in a, almost always in a noisy bar, mm-hmm. which is good and bad. So what do you do at a release party? Drink beer and fall over. <laughs> okay, what does everybody else do at a release party? <laughs> Watch me fall over. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hand out CDs to unsuspecting no, passers-by? Actually, I tried at one mm. um, a few years ago in, in one of the bars in London, and this couple came over and they said, what are you lot all doing here? And uh, I said, oh, we've just had this new product that we put out, new version. And they said, oh, yeah, what's that then? And I started explaining, and she was there for about, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes while we were drinking and chatting away and asking about what it is. And then I said, uh, I should get you a CD, actually. I couldn't find it. I didn't have any on me. And there just happened to be one guy walk past with his bag. And I said, hey, hey, have you got an Ubuntu CD? And he went, yeah. So I grabbed it. And this is after this woman had walked away. So I grabbed the CD off him and I went off looking for her around the bar. <laughs> it was quite a big bar. I, went, I eventually found her and I think she thought, oh, God, it's him again. <laughs> so I just gave her the CD and walked away. So, well, yeah, it's quite nice. It's a yeah, bit of a chat. Do you all wear Ubuntu T-shirts? Some people do, Yes. Fair enough. <laughs> Excellent. And we've also got Bar Camp here Blackpool coming up on the 3rd of July, which is a free unconference. You can find out more at barcampblackpool.com. It's in the Blackpool Pleasure Beach Casino. Wow. Uh, apparently last year they had crowdsourced web development sessions, geocaching and Android application development, amongst Excellent. other stuff. Sounds super geeky. Yeah, I didn't hear about it last year, but it sounds really good. Yeah, yeah. Get along. We should send a roving reporter. We should do. The stress levels are increasing. Og camp is in a few days away. Uh-huh. Or if you're listening to this next week, it happened last weekend, and why weren't you there? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or if you listen to it in a year, it was last... Never mind. No. <laughs> um, yeah, it's this weekend. Yeah. OMG. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting, excited. I'm really getting cool. excited now. The last week, oh, my excitement levels have been overtaking the worry and, and stress levels a bit. It's we're, great. we're being sent lots of really cool stuff as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the the uh, the not, raffle. Not for us, of course. No, sadly. Um, it's worth just uh, letting people know what we've got because the raffle is one of the ways we kind of cover the cost of the event. You know, it's a unique feature, I think, in open source conferences. <laughs> yep. Um, and we've been given a load of stuff. We've got three Viglan MPCLs. Um, we've got a load of books from Wiley, the publishers. We've got two Alicia PCs different ones i can't remember a t1 and a d1 i think uh-huh. which are these kind of tiny little form factor things um some books and ebook vouchers from a press some swish ubuntu backpacks from the good people at canonical uh, an o2 joggler and a 1.5 terabyte usb disc from ebuyer mm. uh, so far who knows what will arrive by the weekend yes some hubcaps maybe <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah there's a really kind of I mean there's a fantastic collection of geeky prizes and things to have there so that's almost enough on its own to make me go along and also there's um, something extra we haven't mentioned before on the Friday before the Og Camp starts on the Saturday mm-hmm. on the Friday we've got a geek nick a picnic for geeks mm-hmm. um, and it's going to be at 4 o'clock in St John's Garden so if you're going to be in Liverpool during the day if you're getting there a bit early or maybe the night before it's a great way to kickstart the weekend, and if it rains, yep. we'll move inside to a pub or something, and that'll continue through the evening, um, so long as there's you know enough people to form a geeknik. Yeah, um, I think Laura Tchaikovsky is organising that one. Yep. 
Um, as along as if with, she's not along with many other things. <laughs> yeah, as if she's shorter things to organise. And then that evening from 8 o'clock on the Friday night is the Rat Hole Road Show, which is down from the, from the Linux Outlaws, um, one of his other shows that he does, which is a free culture gig at the Bad Format Club. You do need a ticket to get in. They're only a fiver, so there's not, mm-hmm. uh, it's not too expensive. Um, I think uh, he was talking about tickets on the door as well. Okay. If there are any left, the, you'll be able to get in. On I the think door. at the time of recording, there are still some left, but yep. um, you know, always check it out. Um, and check out the Rat Hole Radio website for more information about that and the artists appearing. It's going to be fun. I'm going along. I think we all are. Yep. Going to go along, have a few beers. Not too many, hopefully. <coughs> Otherwise, the hangover. Well, well, what o'clock. time do we start the next day? <laughs> ah, well, the doors open at 10 a.m. at the Black E for Old Camp itself. You'll be able to find the venue thanks to the massive banners that Dan has had uh, printed up, um, designed by Fab. Um, they're going to say Old Camp and have the little Og. Oh, lots of the little people. Ogs in different colours. Yes. Um, I was trying to figure out which of the Ogs was supposed to be which one of us. I did wonder about that. I think yeah. the purple one's probably Laura. Yeah, yeah. I thought that. Um, it's her favourite colour. So uh, you have, if you've got ideas, um, Fab set up the site. We talked about it a bit last time, ideas.ogcamp.org, um, where you can put any suggestions up for talks or anything like that. When you get to the event, there'll be a proper form to fill in so that people can vote on talks and things. But yeah, this is just a, to give people an idea. Your of, ideas, yeah. Um, give people an idea of what's going to be happening at the event yeah there's some really interesting things on there mm. um i know you've put you put one up alan but i put um, two up there two up with you. yeah so, i've got to write them now <laughs> <laughs> let's get going on that one then yeah. can you do stuff on your laptop and drive at the same time oh how am no, i gonna do i'll go on the laptop I'll dictate he'll be driving yeah yeah I'll uh, you'll be the simon. secretary simon I'll make, be, make a powerpoint for I'll me i'll be in the back asleep resting <laughs> <laughs> guarding everything um yes excellent so that's um going to be kicking off now that idea is to come to august it had to be password protected because we got a bit of a spam attack over the weekend but the username is everyone and the password is kill all spammers mm-hmm. that's all in one word so you're welcome to uh, log in and, and try that out and then spam it <laughs> on saturday night the um party after the first day is at studio two which is actually really cool because i went up to liverpool last weekend to have a look at the venue and we went to the bar to have a look around and it's really cool. <laughs> it's just, it's it's a real recording studio. And it, like Coldplay re- um, recorded some of their albums. There. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> and uh, famous people. And like, that's actually within the venue that we're doing on camp in? No. Well, that's about a five minute walk down the road. Cool. Um, and they've converted the recording studio downstairs into this bar area and they've still got the separating glass uh, between the two parts of the bar and Could then they've got a two, soundproof bar essentially. Yeah. and then they've got two little recording booths that they've decorated and put bean bags in and stuff it's really nice why don't we have a bar that is a recording studio in hampshire we should do that we could turn your living room into one <laughs> we've got half of that done. <laughs> half of it, and all we need now is a couple of optics on the wall and it'll yes. be fine but yeah, that should be good. Um, 2 a.m., that's going to be a, a late night. Yeah, um, that's from about 6 or 7 in the evening. Yeah. The chef's going to stay behind so yes. we can get food there early on in the evening. Oh, brilliant. Yes. It's really cool. And there's no cost to get in? No. 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 Yeah. It's on to the public, but everybody just turn up. They know we're coming. And it'll yeah. be full of geeks. Yeah. Sunday brings the second day of our camp, rounding off with a live recording of a joint Linux Outlaws and Ubuntu UK podcast episode, um, which was always... Uh, uh, always stressful like and enjoyable so, enjoy so we've done it so many times <laughs> yeah well it was good fun last year yes and uh, we'll be uh, sure to get everybody involved in doing stuff um, after that we'll probably be heading off to some undefined watering hole I'm sure for a, uh, a beer or two to let our hair down or a Diet Coke maybe <laughs> enjoy letting your hair down yeah. I won't be <laughs> <laughs> well those of us who have hair will be letting it down um, and uh, yes so that's uh, that's probably going to be a Sunday evening we'll sure we'll make some sort of announcement during the weekend um, but the uh, the merchandise has started to uh, arrive as well. Have you you've seen it? Have you blogged about it, Alan? Yes. Um, well, most of it's arrived at Dan's place. So, yeah, um, yeah don't go to Dan's garage and <laughs> steal it all from steal Dan's it. garage because that's where it all is at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got some mugs. Um, mugs yep. were really popular last year. Um, and these are really slick ones. Uh, yeah, they were white last year with black uh, logos on and uh, all the names of all our sponsors. And this year we've got black ones. Dave chose a different type of design of mug and then yeah it's a fab, good choice fab's done. Well. sorry it's a good choice as well it it's is really yeah slick and <laughs> yeah it looks really nice and you can get your hands on those in return uh, for a five pound donation to odd camp again it all helps us keep the event free and uh, and costed and funded and stuff so please bring your crispy fibers along in your little mitts as you turn up 
T-shirts? And T-shirts too. Yeah. New this year. We haven't done this before. <laughs> um, there will be a limited edition uh, Og Camp T-shirts for in return for a £10 donation. So if you want to get both, you know what to do. Um, but they're looking really, really cool as well. They haven't actually arrived yet, so fingers crossed they'll be, <laughs> they'll be there by the time. But um, the previews bun- look fantastic, don't they? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different sizes, so you've got to be really quick to get the size you want. Yes. Um, yes. Good luck. Um, but yeah, oh, that sounds fantastic. We have had a, a piece of um, a little bit of disappointing news, which is that the venue have told us that the uh, there's no there's no lift to the first floor. It was supposed to be uh, ready. They're doing a bit of refurb, and it's not going to be ready in time for the event, unfortunately. And that's where our main stage is. It won't be finished in time for Og Camp. The lift to the basement is working, and the exhibition area is on the ground floor. Um, we have crew on hand to help people if you are uh, in a wheelchair. I would like to get upstairs, but obviously it's uh, it's a bit disappointing that you would have to um, be carried up and down, unfortunately. But we thought we would let you know um, as soon as we could so that you are uh, ready for that information. Um, None of this could happen without our fantastic sponsors. Yeah. Uh, that includes Linux Format Magazine, who are our media partner, and did a great job last issue of printing our um, our. Uh, advert, big advert, yep. big advert, and then they've done a little write-up again this month. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. It's great, yeah, really good. Uh, the Open Learning Centre, the Allens, the Allens, who are also uh, coming along and helped us out in lots of ways. Uh, Linux Emporium, providing us with Wi-Fi, yep. doing our Wi-Fi for us. Yeah, fantastic. Obsview, who are a sponsor, marvelous. Bitfolk who are also a sponsor, will be sponsoring the refreshments, and Andy will be there, and Andy will be Andy there. Did so. offer to help set up. Really? Yeah. Oh, he's a top man. I love our sponsors. Recruit 12. <laughs> yep. Uh, who are sponsoring us and they are a recruitment agency. Mm-hmm. Specialising in IT geeky people. Linux Fund. They run a credit card Li- Yes, that helps donate to open source software as you're doing it. And there's an extra one. How do you pronounce that, Laura? Exibo. And think. what are they doing? They're um, putting, putting together some digital displays for us. Um, so... John, the nice guy, Spriggs, is writing us some software. And he's ex- a very nice he's guy. He's a very, very nice guy. For those who were at Old Camp last year, he was the one who got very wound up about Pokebook. Oh, yes. And <laughs> had the fantastic Stormtrooper t-shirt. Sparky Stormtrooper, right. right. Um, but yeah, Exebo are putting together the displays, and so we can hopefully have an, a display around with the schedule on the updates without, <laughs> without somebody needing to go down and scribble on the post-it notes with a marker pen. <laughs> A high tech approach. <laughs> yeah, it's a more so high tech approach. Are Exibo making our crew redundant? Is that what's happening? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's going to be plenty for them to do. There's going to be yep. lots for them to do. Yeah, excellent. Um, so if you're excited uh, as we are about OGCamp, um, join us in hash OGCamp on the Freenode IRC network or our Facebook uh, event page. Um, you can find links to all these things on OGCamp.org. And the Twitter identica tag for the weekend is going to be hash OGCamp. So we'll see you there. I've said over the last couple of episodes, I've been doing a little bit of developer work bug. It just doesn't sound right. I'm doing developer work. I've been looking at bugs and things. Now, everybody knows that Ubuntu comes from Debian. Yeah. That is that we, um, at the beginning of a development cycle, somebody grabs um, Debian. Uh, it does a runner with it. Does a runner, <laughs> takes it over to Ubuntu and says, right, this is what we're going to base things on for the next release. Okay. Okay, so lots of work is done by um, the Ubuntu team, um, and then we start getting into bugs and things. So everybody goes off, um, files their bugs on Launchpad. Well, some people do. Some people can't get their heads around it. <laughs> Thank but you. But there you go. And then um, the, uh, the Ubuntu team starts working on those bugs. Now I've got a bit of an issue. And the problem is that there's a ton of work goes into Ubuntu. And there's loads and loads of people. I mean, there's a, there's a group called the Bug Squad, which are people that essentially triage bugs. There's a thousand people there. Wow. There's actually a little bit more than that. But anyway. And so the Bug Squad um, triages all these bugs. And Ubuntu, the Ubuntu developers work on them. Mm. And then um, we push them to Debian. However, that's not how it should work. Really? Yeah. How should it work? Well... I've worked on a couple and, and gone into IRC channels and said, look, I found this bug and I've done a little bit of work. What shall I do? And at every opportunity, everybody says, right, what you need to do is you need to go to Debian and file a bug there. Uh-huh. 
Well, hang on a minute. I uh-huh. want to work on Ubuntu. Yeah, yeah. That depends. Uh-huh. <laughs> what what, what package are these? Are these packages that are, that come from Debian to us? Well, everything comes from Debian to us, pretty no, pretty doesn't. much. No, it doesn't. A lot of well, everything is in universe. So okay, carry on. Okay, so um, I don't want to work on Debian. I want to work on Ubuntu. Why don't you want to work on Debian? Because I want to work on Ubuntu. Yeah, but working on Debian is working on Ubuntu. Well, no, it's not. It's working on Debian. No. So my, no, that's the that's the very blinkered way of saying it. Just <laughs> bloody minded saying it. Well, no, it if isn't. you work on Debian, if you fix something in Debian, that's going to trickle down to the next Ubuntu, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't want to fix it in in time. I want to fix it now. So if, if I have the okay, opportunity so to, to to work, well, no, no, because everybody is suggesting that I don't fix it on Ubuntu. I fix it on Debian, and it will trickle down. But hang on a minute, the bug is in Ubuntu. Well, it might be in both. It depends. And so. If we've got all these thousands of people just triaging bugs and developers working on the bugs, how many people to have Debian have doing exactly the same task? Well, it depends on the bugs, really. So, so let's take, for example, you've got a bug in a package that's in Ubuntu, and that package came from Debian, and there's a mm. Debian maintainer for it. So there's yep. someone who looks after the Deb yep. in, in, in Debian. Mm. And there's also an upstream. So there's someone who wrote the code that mm-hmm. isn't a Debian developer, yep. but a Debian developer took it, turned it into a Deb, and now it's in Ubuntu as well. And you're in Ubuntu, and you find a bug. You you find a bug in that package. Yep. Okay, so, or a user finds a bug in the package, mm-hmm. and they file it in Launchpad. So there's now this bug filed in Launchpad, and the triages that you mentioned, those loads of dedicated people who sit there and figure out whether it is a bug or not, and whether it's a duplicate of another bug, and whether it's actually intended behavior and all that kind of stuff. Yep. They might look at that and say, well, actually, that package, the, the, bit, the feature that you're, that you're calling it a bug, is actually the same problem occurs in Debian. And in fact, someone in Debian has also had that problem. And they have filed a bug in Debian. So it might be that someone's already done that bit. Cool. On some occasion, that happens. Yep. And in fact, in Launchpad, you can link a bug in Launchpad to a bug upstream. Mm-hmm. And those upstream places c- includes Debian. So you can say, this bug in Ubuntu is related to this bug in Debian. And it might actually be the same thing. Sure. As well as that, you can also file bugs up, 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 upstream. So where, where it originally came from. So I'll give you an example there. Tomboy, yep. the note-taking application. Mm-hmm. If something goes horribly wrong when I'm synchronizing my Tomboy notes on Ubuntu, and it all goes horribly wrong and I lose a note, I think, oh, that's really annoying. I'll file a bug. So I run the relevant thing or press the relevant buttons and a bug gets filed in Launchpad because that's where the Ubuntu bug software yep. files a bug. Then the maintainer for that, who is Sandy Armstrong, mm-hmm. goes and has a look at it and he says, actually, that's not a bug in Ubuntu. That's a bug upstream. Do you mind filing it? Now, upstream might mean Debian. It might mean Tomboy. Mm-hmm. In this particular case, it means Tomboy. So I then go to the GNOME bug tracker, Bugzilla. I log on and I file exactly the same bug in Tomboy upstream. Now, I could have bypassed all of that. Oh, and I link the two together. Sure. So they're now linked. And if the status changes in GNOME, it changes in Launchpad automatically. So when, when Sandy fixes that in upstream Tomboy, that status that it's now fixed... Yep. Is reflected in Launchpad automatically. But that, that's a process thing. Mm-hmm. Not the fix doesn't appear in Ubuntu any quicker. No, not yet, not yet. But, but that, that's great on a on a on a package that is um, uh, widely used. But what if you've got something that isn't? What if you find a bug in Ubuntu? And nobody's found it in Debian. Mm-hmm. But does the bug exist in Debian? Well, that's all part of the testing process. Uh-huh. If you find that it does also um, happen in Debian, the guidance that I've been given until today, and I'll come up with the final answer in a minute because I've been quite frustrated by this, the, the, the guidance is, has always been go and file the bug in Debian, uh-huh. and in theory, you should be working at a Debian level, not at a Ubuntu level. Well, yeah, I mean, are they expecting you to have a, a Debian in a VM or something to test whether it has the same bug as you identified in Ubuntu in order to be able well, to file it? I mean, essentially, that's what I've been doing. I tweeted about it. Um, yeah. And so I have been doing the testing on Debian as well. But it's a little frustrating because 
I don't want to work on Devin. I, I want see, to work on Ubuntu. Yeah. And that's where my frustration has come well, because everybody's the, been saying, yeah, go and do it in Debian. Well, the, yeah, the key problem is, well, not problem, the key thing to remember is we don't exist without Debian. We, we, we have nothing without what Debian have built before us. Okay, absolutely. And so it makes total sense and, and re- it, it's responsible to feed back to them because it reduces the amount of duplication of work later on. Okay. So, so for example, for... If, if we patch it in Launchpad, okay, yep. let's say we patch it in Ubuntu and we fix that thing, but we don't go upstream to Debian and fix it upstream. That means there's a delta between what's in Debian and what's in Ubuntu, and that has to be resolved the next time we synchronize that, that package from Debian. But shouldn't there be a mechanism to push those fixes in Ubuntu back up there to... Is. There is. There, there is, is a go. script called Submit to Debian. Excellent. And it does... What does exactly. that do? <laughs> Have a guess. <laughs> I did it myself. I've done. I've got one patch in Ubuntu, and it's one line. <laughs> and I went through exactly this process yep. about a year ago, or whenever it was. Yep. And I still harp on about it. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, I found a bug in Ubuntu, and it was in a script. And I spoke to the developers, well, not a script, in a C program. And I spoke to a couple of developers: Daniel Hobback, James Westby, and uh, Ian Lane. And they all said the same thing: file it in Debian. Mm-hmm. because the person who maintains that Debian package, that .deb package, there's no one responsible for it in Ubuntu. The person who's responsible for the creation of that .deb package is a guy, Joey Hess, in, in Debian. So it makes sense, given there is someone who's looking after that and who cares for that package sure. in Debian, but there's nobody, no physical person who cares for that package. It's all automated scripts yep. in Ubuntu. It makes sense to pass that up to him, and he can say yes or no, that's good or a bad patch or that's good or a bad you know, fix or no, that doesn't need to be done. And that's exactly what I did. I actually did it in Ubuntu first. I patched the, the broken thing in Ubuntu. And then once I got that patch working and I could prove that I could rebuild the package on Ubuntu and it worked mm-hmm. and there was no problem with it, I then asked James, what do I do with it now? And he said, send it upstream to Debian because that's where it's looked after. You run a script and it does it all for you. But in theory, you should have done it on Debian and not on Ubuntu. Um, arguably, there would have been some less work, yes. Yeah. Potentially. Oh, but the thing is, really... I don't run Debian. No, but you should. And that's, that's no, why. I I, no, no. That's Didn't why I've been just, frustrated. You just swapped arguments. No. no. <laughs> I'm and really confused why, now. That's why I've been frustrated because everybody is saying that you should file it with Debian rather than Ubuntu. Oh, not necessarily rather. I mean, uh, it, it's debatable. It, de- it depends on the package. Like, for example, um, I've been sat around in the Hash Tomboy channel a lot and I've been speaking to Sandy and, you know, I've helped him a little bit. And so sometimes when I look at stuff and I think, is that a Tomboy problem or is that an Ubuntu problem? For example, Tomboy in Ubuntu is different from Tomboy upstream because it has the, or it was at some point, because it had the patches to make it work with Ubuntu 1 synchronization. Now, Sandy has taken those patches and put them into upstream Tomboy. But it's only because we fed them up to him that that happened. Is it? It, it, it seems a little counterintuitive, particularly again as we, for new users, as we've, we've talked about before. If, if I'm in a restaurant and I'm having, I don't know, a steak, and I, I I find there's a problem with the steak, it's not done the way I like it or whatever. I complain to the restaurant. Uh-huh. They don't go. Well, actually, you need to go and talk to the butcher who's around the corner in another street, uh-huh. and you go and complain to him about the. But nobody's saying you should have to do that. It, you can, you can. You've got that. the option of complaining. You can do it. that. This is more about fixing it than being the, the end yeah, user. Yeah, the, the end user it. is a it can be right. a fire and forget process. Okay. Like I found this bug. I've done my bit of responsibility, which is click the button that says send this to Launchpad, right. and then it's up to the triagers and the developers to decide what they do about that. So this is so then that's what the sh- it's the chef or the owner of the restaurant's responsibility about whether he takes that on himself and says okay that was a bad bit of meat my my fault and I won't you know, yeah maybe I'll get it from somewhere else this analogy is going way <laughs> way a bad, doing well what is it they say yeah. a bad a bad analogy is like a leaky screwdriver <laughs> that's one of Hugo's best ones <laughs> so it depends on the package now one useful thing is there's a thing called the upstream report. Mm-hmm. And the upstream report, I'll put a link in the show notes. If you if you go to that, it's a report on Launchpad. It actually shows you all the packages that are in Ubuntu. It shows you how many bugs there are and how many of those bugs have been have got uh, upstream equivalents are linked to upstream bugs. So you can see when there's a big delta, and that that is you know 
if there's a big delta, then we're not being responsible in sending our patches that are appropriate patches yeah. upstream. That kind of leads me on to, with all these uh, people working on Ubuntu and the financial backing of Canonical and what appears to be less people working on Debian, why isn't the role reversed? Why, I know that Debian came first, but why don't Debian feed from Ubuntu rather than Ubuntu feed from Debian? I think I'm not. I'm not entirely convinced there are more people on working on Ubuntu. I think you'll find there's actually a fair overlap between okay. them. For example, there are people who work on there's there's a team in Ubuntu working on games packages, and there's a team in Debian who work on games packages, and there's actually it's the same people. So there are, there is an yeah. overlap between Ubuntu and Debian. I know that Canonical have employees working for Debian. Yeah, think, some of we've, the, we've covered that before. Yeah, I'm lots sure. lots of people who work for Canonical like. Uh, the release manager for Ubuntu is a Debian developer. The guy who wrote the installer is a God, Debian developer. Yeah. You know, these are all, these. Are, so I'm not. I'm not. I, I. I don't think it would be productive to turn it on its head. I think it's right that we feed from Debian mm-hmm. because they have that quality product that we pull from and we build on and we add our stuff, our magic sauce or whatever. Sure. Hmm. So what happened the other the, the other day or today to change your? I've been. Yeah. Um, there's a big patch review coming up uh next week and i've been looking at some of the documentation for that and um <clears throat> i asked loads of questions of the guys uh Dan holbeck and uh nigel babu who are uh sort of getting the, the documentation together and it spoke about important bugs and i asked the question they said well look there's a point where you fix it in ubuntu first and there's a point where you fix it in debian first and essentially it comes down to the importance of the bug and that really is as simple as it is. Mm-hmm. Somebody sets the importance, and if it's, and this may change, if it's <laughs> medium and below, it goes into Debian first, and if it's uh, high and critical, it goes into Ubuntu first. So that's it. I mean, that literally did just take my frustration away completely because it's simply your bugs laid down that. there. Yeah, they are, but... But it gives you, it gives you it, guidance. And that's well, exactly I mean, obviously, there's, what there's wiggle room there. And some bugs, it will be, some bugs don't no, go no, to you, Debian. Don't, you're upsetting Simon now. So no, there's no, no wiggle room. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's yeah. the rule. These are the rules. Okay. <laughs> so it, what about it, Tomboy then? <laughs> is, is that critical or, the, or that, that uh, severity based on the impact to the user? Impact on the Users. Well, the users. users. Sorry, yes. yeah, yeah. I use the yeah. user in this. And, and there's a page that defines what a medium level and a low level and a high level is. And, that's just, and that is right. the critical point in the whole process of triage. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's the whole oh, yeah, critical point. Just went out of the room. <laughs> My ears popped. Oh. Um, and, and that really is the most important part, whether you go into Ubuntu first or Debian first. I think my key thing would be take advice. The guys in the Motu channel are clueful people. They, and do you know what? They are incredibly nice and helpful. They are unbelievably nice. Yes. And I have found I actually get a fairly consistent answer from all of them. Yep. Send it upstream to Debian, whatever it is. Well, if you've got experience of trying to triage bugs and sending them to either Debian or Ubuntu or the uh, upstream developers, uh, give us your feedback. You can email us at podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or via any of the other methods you can find on our website. And now it's time for a bit about Ubuntu. So the um, Launchpad single si- single sign-on is now being open-sourced. Mm. This is this the open ID broker amongst other things. Yeah. Yeah, it's the bit you see with an orange yes sign me in button when you when you sign into Launchpad or Ubuntu One or associated stuff. Uh, yeah, and uh, I see they've released it under AGPL three, the Afro or the Afro GPL as people like to call it. Um it was the only bit that wasn't open sourced when Launchpad was open sourced. Wasn't no, it? Is the, that right? I think the sign on was open sourced with La- Launchpad, but this has been added since then or something. From what John was saying. Oh, okay. All right. But it's nice to know another chunk of code being put out there. I guess people can now integrate that functionality in their own sites. I guess so. Projects. Mm. Oh, always good. Well, it's also nice that you get visibility of the code. So peer review, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a heavily yeah. used single sign-on thing. And, uh, you know, there's potentially your credit card details behind it if you're buying music from the music store. And there's all your SSH keys and all kinds of useful information that could potentially be in there if you're using file sharing or, you know, 
Yes, and um, with the sort of integration of things like the music store and increasing projects in the Ubuntu One field, I guess it's kind of affects more and more people as as particularly as the next release comes up, yeah. when everybody will be buying their music using Ubuntu One. Actually, do you know, on the way here, I was listening to music on the radio, and I thought, I must buy that track on Ubuntu One, and then I forgot to do it. <laughs> I see there, there was a bug filed about it not being open source, and uh, three people have said it affects them. <laughs> <laughs> Just three? Just three. Wow. I thought there were more people using Ubuntu. Yeah. Clearly not. The Canonical Design team have opened up and published a load of documents about their plans for the future. And uh, there's a new um, aggregated blog for the design team. Mark Shuttleworth has also blogged about this. And um, it covers quite a lot of ground. And... Um, Kind of, some of it's interesting and it, it, uh, the, for a start, design.canonical.com, which is where the design team are now blogging, looks very swish. It mm. does. It's mm. got all the new branding and things on it, and there's a there's a slightly different version of canonical, as in the, the word canonical. It's 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 like it's been rebranded along like, along with it has been yeah, but with a kind of O it's that's got filled, filled in filled in, filled in, in O, o yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah that's the new one oh, that yeah. looks very nice as well so people like Matthew Paul Thomas are blogging on there Ivanka. and Ivanka's on there and a whole whole heap of other people um, the particular thread that we're, we're talking about here is it, the first one that we've clicked on for example is the farewell to the notification area with Matthew Paul Thomas saying that. The notification area, aka system tray, which <laughs> everybody calls it, even though it's nothing to do with that. And he gives um, the whole history of why it was called notification area and how people didn't use that name. Yeah, but that's going away. Mm. But yeah, so it's nice to have a place that there is going to be discussion about the design elements because that was some of the criticism over the new branding as it just got dumped on it. Yeah, I think part of this is a response to the criticism they had about things like the buttons and the theme and the rebranding and stuff. So yeah, they're working on it. Okay, it would have been nice to have this six months ago, but you know, Hey-ho. yeah, it's good for the future. I wonder how far in advance they're going to release information. Well, this stuff, they're talking about stuff that's going to be in not just 1010, but also 1104, some of the plans they've got for, you know, next year. Yeah, but they are, that's slightly different. That's not really what I asked. What I meant is <laughs> how much time are we going to have before these things change? Because, of course, it's in a commercial development, so they're not going to release their their new plans that too soon before they make the changes, I'm sure. They are going to keep us informed, but not mm. that far in advance. I'm sure there'll be a couple of surprises in there just to keep yeah, things interesting. Think, yeah. yeah. Uh, as part of that, there's, a bit, there's um, some changes to the battery status bit mm. or addition of a battery status menu yeah i quite like the look of this yeah <coughs> mac really <laughs> yeah okay you click on the thing in the corner of the screen on the mac and it tells you how much battery life your keyboard has your mouse has everything i i've not i've not seen that on the mac but it, the, the example um sort of mock-up menu that we've got on the uh, on the, the web page is, does it have a picture of a mouse and a picture of a keyboard by any chance? it has a picture of a mouse it has a picture of a the laptop battery and an ipod ah, okay so just, something else you might have plugged in that has a battery yeah. in it yeah it's but, a great idea so yes. you can you know anything that's got a battery you just click one place see all the batteries in all your devices yes yeah, so i do like the idea as somebody who charges one of the things i like about uh, Ubuntu is that I can charge my iPod and st- I have an iPod I charge my iPod and still use it as an iPod you can have it charging while you're using it whereas no, not, not, on not, Windows it mounts it and uh, you can't do anything else with it until you un- dis- physically disconnect it speaking of which I discovered my printer has a USB port on it for plugging the camera in so you can offload pictures and print them directly from the camera and also the printer is connected via USB to my PC which means I lose one of my USB ports but the really cool thing is that USB port on the printer can be used for charging stuff. So I charge my phone off my printer. <laughs> cool nice. That? That's cool. I wonder if this would be able to detect my phone all the way through the printer and into the phone. No reason why it shouldn't. That would be good. Sounds fun. Yeah, I'll file a bug when it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so John has been blogging about having a power user community, which I think sounds quite a cool idea because especially with all these design changes changes recently, I think a lot of the complaints come from people who are kind of power users in the sense that they're quite happy to tweak things and make things as customised as possible. So have a power users community and then ignore them. Is that what you're saying? No. He's, yeah, just lump them all in a box in a <laughs> corner and they can <laughs> complain to themselves. Yeah. Uh, no, he's uh, looking for somebody to lead the community. I assume he's still looking. That's what his blog post says. Um, yeah. 
and yeah, every step forward, yeah. And try and pull together a lot of hints and tips and how you how you pimp your PC and it's a tricky one. I don't, I, I, would you say you're a power user? Uh, I guess I used to be. Now I don't care so much. I just use my computer. I guess I am a power user, really, but I don't care. It's all relative, isn't it? <laughs> like, relative to my mum, we all are. Yeah. yeah. My mum has been using a computer for a week. <laughs> I say I'd have the, I have the capability to be a power user, but on the whole, I don't bother. I think that's where it put me. I guess it depends how you define power user. Well, anybody who likes to pimp their laptop to some extent. Really? Is that is that how you would define it, or is that how Jono defines it? No, that's me. I'd I mean, I, I don't even change my desktop background. No, I don't either. I'd agree with Laura, actually. Well, it's, yeah. it's about how much change you make. Mm. It's about how deep you get into things. If you're just going to sort of, um, you know, use Ubuntu as it comes, then you should use it. But if you're going to get in there and change things and move things around and make change to the system, then, yeah, I think you are a power user. Okay, that's that. So it's all about change, or is it all about using the keyboard instead of the mouse? No, and... it's making it so that it suits you down to the last little inch, potentially. I mean, I okay. used to be a Windows power user. I used yeah. to customise all kinds yeah, of I stuff think, on there. I think but I probably was. I've kind yeah. of gone off bothering. I've got, I've got a, <laughs> a, a question. With Jono suggesting that this community gets established is it sort of saying that essentially uh, ubuntu isn't for those people no it he, i think he said that it's it kind of appears that it can appear that to those people that it's not for them anymore mm. and what i think he's trying to say is that yeah all right out the box it's as simple and as lightweight as it can yeah. be but the idea is they can pull together all kinds of tips and how you do so is this to, to rescue the people that we normally lose to arch linux or i think this is actually, mint or something um, sneaky in that i think he's just trying to get another bit of the community together gathered in a corner over there and then you can actually sort of get them encourage to do them your to bidding do things yes. you know so well you know you guys are you you all use Ubuntu to a certain standard. You are actually in a position to to give back. Why don't you mm. guys, some of you guys go there and do a bit of documentation? Yeah, you're not quite smart. Maybe you could be a, do a bit of a development. You're so cynical, Simon. I'm not cynical. I think I can no, just a, see I what it's a great idea. I think it's a good <laughs> idea to have all these people who who you know have a lot of experience. Maybe they could, as part of that power user community, drive some better support or yep. drive better you know answering launch pad answers or being better bug triages because they're power users of the system and they know yeah. it better i think it's going out to try and get re or re-engage those people who probably at the beginnings of ubuntu they were a necessity to getting it going and now they're for, it's like i mean you can tell by the reaction of some of the things like the design work they're feeling pushed out of what right. ubuntu's aimed at mm. and this is i think this is just a way to re-engage them and get them feeling part of the community again mm. Communities within communities. Good stuff. <laughs> it's important. You know, we've mm. got a bunch of women going. I'm w seriously into the Ubuntu handbit. You know, it's important. Mm. Yeah, interesting stuff. I have to watch how that one develops. Um, a while ago, in fact, was it season one, we interviewed Phil Newborough about Crunchbang, which was a an Ubuntu derivative designed to use our open box yep. rather than any of the other GNOME desktops or other things like that. Mm -hmm. He's relaunched the project. Um, but it's no longer an Ubuntu derivative. It is now a Debian derivative, ignoring the fact that arguably anything that is an Ubuntu derivative is a Debian derivative. Yeah. Putting that on one side for now, um, which is a, a, a bit of a, a change because he was kind of committed Ubuntu um, tweaker and developer in person. Yeah, and there's a nice interview with him um, on uh, a blog, yeah. and uh, we'll link to that. And it gives he gives some detail about why he switched to basing on Debian. And, he, you know, he's pretty honest about you know, why he prefers yeah. the development process on Debian. I'll just read, read a, a short snippet out, um, which says, Unlike the Ubuntu project, Debian does not have a commercial sponsor with any commercial interests. This was never an issue for myself until recently when Canonical seemed to have become less of a sponsor and more of a governing party. I know this is debatable, but I believe that some of their recent decisions might not necessarily have been made with the best interest of their users' community at heart. Um, he also has some technical reasons about the development cycle and, and why it's better for him to use Debian than Ubuntu as the base. I'm not convinced it will make that much difference to a, a user. Yeah. It'll be you know, the same kind of good-looking, slick user interface, nice and lightweight, still Deb, Deb package-based. Mm -hmm. So everything's yeah. going to you know, work just the same, I think. That's interesting that he's kind of kicked it all off again and obviously putting a lot more energy back into it. And Yeah, good yeah, stuff. Good luck, good luck to him. Yeah. 
A new derivative is in private beta. Peppermint OS, which is based on Lubuntu and takes some elements from Linux Mint, offers a cloud-based distro, which is currently not available for download because it's in private beta. Mm-hmm. The website says it is sleek, user-friendly, and insanely fast. Mm. So is that um, a distro that sits in the cloud, or is it a distro that accesses a cloud or both it's, parts? It's like Jolly Cloud, which is another cloud-based distro and i think all of these cloud-based distros are basically the same thing a bit like google's chrome os so it's predominantly browser-based so it's the client end of it yeah it's the client end and access it to various web-based services and they're using the same thing that jolly cloud does which is mozilla prism which is a plug-in for or add-on for firefox which lets you go to a website and when you press a button it creates a separate window for that application. So it looks like that's an application. Oh, right. So, okay. for example, if you went to Gmail or whatever your webmail thing is and you create a Prism window, then you can alt and tab between oh, applications, right. but they're actually just web apps. It's quite, nice. it's quite cute, but it's not exactly revolutionary. It's not doing anything that things like Jolly Cloud don't already do. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that Ubuntu, we were talking last time, is kind of is trying to combine the best of both worlds with this idea of, is it Zopa? So- Zoho. Zoho. Um, moving to having the cloud access on the desktop when mm. you need it, when you want it. Yeah, so arguably you could do exactly the same thing that Peppermint OS and Jolly Cloud do with Netbook Remix. Now, Jolly Cloud does have some social features, like I could, if I'm a friend of yours on Jolly Cloud and we're both using it and I, and I install you know some application then you get to see that in your timeline. So you might think, oh, Alan's installed that. Oh, I trust his opinion. Therefore, I might install it and have a look at it. You know, so it has some social features that others, that Netbook Remix and Standard Ubuntu mm. might not have. But I don't know. Maybe just, that could be added to Gwibber. Just going to say, just give Gwibber time. Yeah. Yeah, you could link the software center and Gwibber so that whenever you add an application, it fires it across. And then your friends say, there you go. And that's Jolly Cloud out the window. What's next? <laughs> Uh, what is next, apparently, are lots of people who are blue and eight foot tall. Ah. Dustin Vitar. Kirkland. No, I mean, Dustin Kirkland isn't blue and eight foot tall. No, far um, from it. But he has <laughs> but he has blogged about Avatar, the famous 3D film, um, which was apparently all rendered on servers running Ubuntu. Yeah. He blogged about this a little while ago, but I think it's resurfaced because the DVD and Blu-ray discs are out ah, of yes, Avatar. Of and have been the best-selling DVDs um, in the US. Where really? They, yeah, yeah, where they really didn't like How it. How bizarre. Mm, fantastic. Um, yeah, so apparently Avatar was rendered on 4,000 HP servers with 35,000 cores. Yeah. And I also saw that um, Jonathan Riddell from the KDE, KDE Kubuntu, uh, <laughs> you read my mind, <laughs> um, has also blogged about it because um, he said that they also used kubuntu on their desktops ah uh, yes that's one thing they do mention as, as well actually yeah, is that 90 percent or something of the of the company uh weta w-e-t-a the company who made the film uh yeah running ubuntu on their desktops as well or some version of it that's pretty awesome man. Yeah, fantastic that's, that's like huge. normal companies it's doing stuff on ubuntu and it's another creative company as well why haven't mm. we heard about this from the company oh no, no, no. oh yeah they did the, it was a um dustin heard about it at some conference right and a guy from the company said this is what we did and this is the okay. hardware that oh, we okay. used to do it It was a technical conference right. i think um but yeah i don't know if they're going to put it in a press release it's not really interesting to most people i guess right. most people you know yeah. don't really care how the pixels were made it's just you know it's a film sad losers like me <laughs> <laughs> and me The Ubuntu Women Group have launched a photo competition looking for examples of young girls, that's toddlers through to 12 years old, playing with and loving and being encouraged to pursue Ubuntu. This would allow parents of girls to demonstrate that it really is okay to be intrigued by the shiny screens, blinking lights, tappity tap of keyboards and faint whirs of computer fans. Prizes include a netbook and a bundle of Ubuntu swag. Swag. Yeah. So basically all they want you to do is, uh, if you've got a daughter or, you know, someone in your family who uses Ubuntu Mm -hmm. and um, yeah, get a photo of them enjoying using Ubuntu, you know, not beating the screen up. (laughs) Crying. (laughs) Crying. (laughs) Yes. I won't end window. My RAID 5 array won't defray. (laughs) Yes. 
um, yeah, that sounds like a good idea uh, to kind of reinforce positive reinforcement. Of yeah, absolutely. Image. Yeah, it's good. I don't know where they're going to use the images that they'll get out of the competition, but I assume they've got some. I'm not sure, but we'll planned. put a link to the announcement and the details. That's all in the bit about Ubuntu this time. Chris Blowherd is talking about bingo on the last episode and asked. Do you know of a bingo package? I assume there'd been one in the default Ubuntu repositories. I had a look but could not find one. If not, I think now is the time for me to learn some Java slash Ubuntu packaging skills. <laughs> That's a very good idea. So what would a bingo app do? Just uh, like print pr- random numbers on the screen. Random. Can you not just do cat, dev, random. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you start to label bingo balls in hex. <laughs> <laughs> and print them really quickly. Ooh. And shout home every so often. Uh, home? House. Is that what you shout? <laughs> oh, I, was that humour? Do you know what? No, did I miss that? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> God. Laura just out geeked Alan. <laughs> That's quite spectacular. Well, no, I'm just being. Oh, I get it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering why um, Chris said he would specifically use Java. Maybe, whether whether maybe there's an existing package. Well, yeah, but whether there's an existing package, he's talking about mm. packaging up. Is this in Java or a bingo app? Could write it in mono and really go for popularity. This is this is this is what could make the Linux desktop what bingo apps. Yeah. Well, he could use quickly to create it. Opportunistic bit of development there. Yeah. Python, GTK, job done. Matt McGraw emailed in to confess. I'm a stay-at-home dad from Northern California and a huge Ubuntu fan. I discovered the UK Ubuntu podcast at the beginning of season three, and I'm totally enjoying it. Plus, I have a little radio crush on Laura. Smiley face. Aww. Thanks for bringing us all that is Ubuntu each episode. Keep up the good boy, good guy. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Keep up the good work. You guys rock. Oh, thanks oh, very much, Matt. Thanks very much, Matt. Glad you're enjoying the show. Can yeah, listen nice. to all the archive as well. <laughs> yes, you are now obliged to listen to all our shows. Patrick Matson from Sweden was wondering... I understand that part of what makes a distribution special is the applications they chose to be included in the default installation. But I would be very happy if there was an Ubuntu version which only had the minimum of applications. I was thinking of Nautilus and Firefox and not much else. From there, I could add the applications I need. Do you know of any distro that offers that? Yes. Do we know? Oh, that was very quick. SUSE. They have a (laughs) SUSE builder thing. You go to their website and you, you pick which applications you want. And you hit a button and it will build an ISO image and or a USB image and if you want a VMware image as well. And you can actually hit the button once it's built the image and try it out in the browser. Actually log into it remotely or it, download it. It's called SUSE Studio, isn't it? That's the thing. That's yeah. the one. So Sounds I, cool. I know people have suggested that we should do the same thing. You can uh, get a minimal. You can get a minimal Ubuntu installation because I used it. Uh, of the alternate CD, yeah, yes, you can. It's got like next to nothing on it, not even a GUI. No, yeah. Although I did notice that he says I was thinking of Nautilus and Firefox and not much else. Some people would even argue to get rid of Nautilus and yeah. Firefox. Yeah. So you're better <laughs> off starting with nothing actually and working up from there. Why do you need a GUI? You can just use eLinks, absolutely, or W3M, or have a bot that emails you the content of web pages. Your name is Richard Stallman, and I claim my five pounds. <laughs> How could you tell? Peter Cannon sent us a long rant about the experience of new users to Linux. I'm in two minds about the points you raised. The badge of developer seems to make certain people hold them in awe, driving them to make allowances for a appalling interpersonal behaviour with the excuse, oh, they function on a higher level. It cuts no ice with me. It costs nothing to be civil. A kind word and a pat on the back goes a long way. Having said that, I can see how it would be annoying for a certain group to receive communication from individuals whose knowledge and understanding may not be as advanced as theirs. This was after your um, co-worker who got uh, kicked from... How how do we welcome people into the the Ubuntu community? Mm. Interesting, interesting. uh, We've had uh, a bit of feedback and there's another couple of emails about this one. It does seem to divide the community somewhat, polarises them. Mm. Laura, sorry, are you going to say something? I was just going to say I kind of agree with him because it's a bit diva-ish really, isn't it? To to give that excuse. It is. And I don't think it applies. Actually, I've been um, with the developers for the last couple of weeks, almost a month now, and I haven't run into that kind of attitude at all. But we mentioned that last time, that that's probably because of the Code of Conduct and the ethos around Ubuntu. If you did the same thing and you wanted to package a similar whatever it was you were doing and talked only to upstreams and bypassed all of them to Debian, would you have the same experience? 
Good question. Try it. Well, on, on <laughs> that exact... Leave that as your homework. <laughs> <laughs> on that exact same subject, Sorin Silagi says... There's always going to be people with poor social skills and a great passion for virtual drama that can't wait for a nice flame war. All we can do is encourage a certain behaviour through culture and guidelines and hope for the best. And in this respect, I think the Ubuntu community is doing rather well. I don't really follow the forums, but whenever I went there for help, the experience has been quite positive. Hmm. But that's partly because they enforce a set of rules and yeah. guidelines for how to behave, isn't it? Well, if the, if, But yeah, and if those guidelines are working for us and our community, then great. Whereas the mailing list that your co-worker went on, they were enforcing this set of guidelines by kicking her off. Yes, I think there's a difference between kind of kicking and guidance, isn't there? Hmm. I'm, I must admit, I'm, I'm fairly civil most of the time. <laughs> But well, today well, I wasn't. Somebody no. very close to me, like about an arm's length away from me, <laughs> sent an email. And it was about 400 lines of quote and uh, one word reply. If I, no, sorry, it wasn't you. It was me. I haven't sent any emails today. It was the other one. <laughs> <laughs> what, the other girl? Yeah. Oh, my life. <laughs> so about that Ubuntu women segment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> What did you do, Simon? No, he just had a bit of a rant. I was just like, uh, yeah, I just had a bit of a rant. It's fine. Good, I'm, I'm glad. So we need to enforce the code of conduct within our... Within, really within Og- <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> well, yes, that told me. Hugh Sanders sent some HTML email which defies description, presumably as punishment for something Simon said in the last episode. Oh, not me again. <laughs> I think you said, what's the problem with HTML email, didn't you? And he sent us something that was purple and pink and had ponies in it. Oh, yes, those oh, straight bizarre ponies, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apparently there's a website where you can generate those pony pictures. Really? Yes. Put it in the show notes. Uh, yeah, all right then. Cesar San Pedro is the art director at Geardrome.com. We're a company who create uh, games for the iPhone and for consoles. We have previously worked on games such as Motorstorm 2 and Heavy Rain on the PS3 and have recently released a new title for iPhone called Ozone. The art for this game is based completely on Ubuntu, uh, GIMP and Blender. We think Ubuntu is a great OS and have proved it by basing all the artwork on it. I think that's really good, but... (laughs) Yeah, go on. Let's see if we can release the games for Ubuntu as well as just using it for generating the artwork. Yeah, I guess they want uh, some revenue. <laughs> yeah, no, that's understandable, but, you know, releasing for Ubuntu as well. Yeah, I, when I first saw this mail, I did. it kind of struck me as an advert, and then it wasn't until I read, oh, actually, they did the artwork on Ubuntu. Yeah, well, it shows that, you know, real creative stuff can be done using GIMP and Blender and you know, Inkscape and things like that. Real people really do use yes. Ubuntu. I, um, I tweeted last week, my daughter's doing uh, art GCSE, GCSE uh, and she's doing some photography and tweaking the photos and cool. using GIMP to do it. So Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, she took her laptop into school and everybody went, yeah, what's that? Nice. <laughs> it's, it's a you, laptop, it's you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have them around them parts. <laughs> it's Ubuntu. And that's all your feedback. <laughs> it's the end of a long night. Is it tomorrow yet? Feels like Almost. It. I've only got to get Move, a six It's hours. on camp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Well, um, thanks for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail and Facebook and Twitter and Identica and all the other stuff. And the next time you hear from us will be from Og Camp. It will be from Liverpool. <laughs> See you all there. Bye. 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 Bye.